Hi everyone, I'm Tim Von Rieden, better known as Von Art Online, and welcome to my weekly Wednesday live stream. I do these every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central Time, mainly to discuss art, show an art technique, or draw something that is relevant. And I'm always open to any comment or question, regardless of what I'm actually working on. If you have comments about or questions about conventions or um, shading techniques, I am definitely open to do that as well. So this is meant to be a, a conversation between myself and whoever would like to learn or just chat while they draw. And I actually recommend if you are watching to draw alongside me. I don't think it's necessary to watch me draw the whole time. I want this to be something to encourage other people to draw while I'm working because I know it helped me knowing that other people were working around side me when I was in college. Okay, so with that, I only have a few things I would like to say. Um, the first one is we have a Discord channel. You can join that below. I'm like I said, I'm much more active nowadays, and I would love to see your face on that as we get more contests and challenges and things that will be kind of fun to put into an art community. Second thing, I was recommended an artist named Harry Clark, and I actually took that recommendation, and I bought a book of him. If you don't know who Harry Clark is, it's okay, because I didn't either, to be honest. And his stuff is fantastic. Let me find one of these. Like, look at this. Let me make sure you guys can see this. Like, he's this older artist, but he does these very over-the-top, bold choices. And thank you, Catrustic, for following. Um, he's also known for stained glass work, which I believe that's more in the back. But I just like these very bold choices of contrast and value. And it has, like, this surreal decadence to it that I very much enjoy. But then, in the back... Let me find some of the stained glass stuff. So he do, does a lot of this type of work too, which is definitely also impressive. But being a black and white artist, I definitely am drawn to the ink stuff. But it's interesting. Every time I dive into color, I really enjoy it. But I think there's just something about the pencil stuff that really just feels like home to me. Um, doo -doo -doo. oh, are you guys ready for this? So a few, may, few of you may not even know this, but I've always talked about doing a four foot drawing. Oh, thank you, Blueberry Fist for Fallen. I always kind of talk about doing a four foot drawing and it's one of those things that I'm always like, Tim, you better either put up or shut up because um, you gotta stop saying this unless if people, or you're gonna give the people what you're saying you're gonna do. So look what I bought. So I literally bought a four foot canvas and a four or like this giant canvas holder. It can go up to, I think, nine feet. So I'm going to start with four feet, see where we get with that. But this is something that I'm going to be working on all through 2019. I still don't have a concept for it, but that's kind of the fun part. Um, you're like diving in the mystery of what will this be? And I think I'm going to keep that a complete secret to the public and have it be like a Patreon exclusive thing where if you want to see my progress on it throughout the year, um, it's gonna be like just for my Patreon backers. It was like my way of getting back into really diving into Patreon because I want to do more stuff at home. I went to 22 conventions this year and it kind of wore me a little thin. So I'm kind of restructuring how I would like to go about next year. And this is one of the things I want to do. And the other thing that I found while I was cleaning our wonderful golden fridge, hence the golden fridge emoji. So I think I'm going to redo the golden fridge. I might even remake the fridge altogether. And I feel like that will be something, I wanna keep that tradition going. I like the inside joke of it. And if you don't know what it is, I'll tell you at a later date or someone in the discord will. And it's something that I am definitely interested in redoing. Okay, and the last thing is, what am I doing today? What, who is Red? What is Swordplay? Basically, this is an illustrated novel that I've had in my head since I was a little kid. At that time, I thought it was going to be a video game. But now that I'm older, a little wiser, <laughs> I've realized um, I can't make it into a game per se, but I can definitely illustrate the whole thing by hand. So I have the first four pages done of the story. And if you want to actually read it, I posted it in the Discord already. So you can see here are the blanks without any of the words. And I do, I write all the words digitally. 
Um, I don't trust myself doing it traditionally because oftentimes there are grammar errors and I don't want to mess up the original drawings. So with the last page of Red's backstory, I actually feel like I messed up. I never liked this composition. This is it actually. This was how it was going to look. And it just never felt right. I didn't like the look of it. And I think that was the main reason why I paused my Patreon in August and why I halted Swordplay was because I hated the picture so much I didn't want to put it out in the world as if this was something I was proud of. And with Swordplay, I want to be proud of it. So we're going to be restructuring it a little bit with instead of at the end of the backstory, Red becomes uh, kind of like a junior knight, if you want to call it that. And she, you're during like a ceremony where they pass the preliminaries. So anyways, Red was going to be next to Kelly. And she was going to have that like that smile on her face like, yeah, like I've made it in the next step of my life. And it's kind of similar to like graduating college. You haven't really done anything in your career yet, but you have all the tools to do the thing in your career. So that's the the emotion I wanted to get from it, but I just didn't feel like this captured it and I didn't like the awkward composition and how I was gonna cut it off. So I'm gonna do what I do best and do it in profile. I know it's something I joke about that I do too much, but hey, we're gonna keep that going and finish red right off in a way that I feel is much stronger than the other one. So this I have to have done by the end of December along with my collector. And for those of you who wanna see a little sneak of that, this is currently, you know what, I'll put it under here. So this is my drawing with all the hands and arms. And we're getting there. I feel like I, I am just, I'm so close to the halfway point. I try to do about four to 10 hands every day. And, oh, well, thank you, Buttman for following and Apocalypse for following. Uh, and it, it's taking me a little bit, but I also plan on getting this done before December. And lastly, I guess, if you want to see, I'm also working on my Hollow Queen. Not much I can show here. I just kind of worked on the leg that one stream, but I guess I kind of worked on the hand. Um, but this one, I'm not, I, initially I was going to also have this finished by the end of 2018, but now I'm like, you know what, if it's finished at the end of January, it doesn't matter too much. Um, I'm already giving myself too many deadlines with, uh, finishing this because then after I finish this I have to create her zine and I want to send that to a bunch of people so I got to get this finished first okay so if you want to have any questions while I'm working on this I'm gonna go ahead and start rendering out her face you know what though I might edit the lighting in here just a little bit well I think you merely mirthful for following let me go ahead and I'm gonna change the brightness here Ooh, don't like, that's way too dark. I just wanna make sure that you guys can see this. Hmm, let me get a little more. Okay, I think that's a little better. Hopefully. I mean, I, I'm drawing it really light. Oh, but that makes my hands look super pink. Oh, it looks so weird. Hold on. I'm going to change the color intensity, and then I'll go ahead and start drawing. Maybe the contrast is too high, too. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. I like that way better. It's a little more muted gray. Okay, um, let me really quickly see if there was any comments that I missed that I want to say. Yes, GK, it, it is helping a lot, so you should feel honored because you did an excellent job. Um, Basil says, I usually draw while watching the stream, but now I have to study for my final exam tomorrow. Well, definitely do that. <laughs> uh, Mighton, that's called an easel. Thank you. For some re weird reason, I always forget what that's called. Um, Jamie says, last year using Tobra was the first one I participated in. It was the first time I used so much ink. I loved it so much. It's now something I plan on using as my main medium. I encourage you all to just jump in and try something new. Yeah. Jim, what is the world of swordplay? 
Okay, maybe I'll talk about that while I start rendering out red. And I'm going to be working with an H pencil, a kneaded eraser, and this Mono E0 eraser. Which we actually talked about this in the Discord a little bit. Apparently a lot of you don't like it as much. But I think you're pushing down too hard with the pencil because this thing I use more often than I feel the kneaded eraser. And if you push down too hard or if you're working with like a 2B or darker pencil, it won't lift up. So you do have to be careful with this eraser because if you are a heavy handed artist, this will not be a very good tool for you. And Tigil even mentioned he uses it more as like a highlight rather than like a full on eraser and uh, sticks with the kneaded more often than not. Yes, I'm going to have Christmas music playing in the background, but I'll turn it down just a hair so it's not super obnoxious. All right, so I'm going to start off with an H pencil and I'm going to go ahead and get to it. So for red, I really don't need reference as much as I might for my other characters. I feel like I've drawn her so many times. I kind of know the look of her. It's always good though to keep some reference on the side. Like maybe I'll have, let's see here. Like I really like how I did her profile on here. So maybe I'll use that as like my external reference. And then I also have some digital pieces I could pull up. There we go. So the world of swordplay, people ask me this a lot at cons because I talk about how I'm working on an illustrated novel. And I explain it to them that for me, swordplay is like, a magical world in the same sense that Spirited Away was a magical world, where it's like the magic isn't the main focus. It's there, it's present, but it's not really talked about. I think too many uh, shows that are magical, it becomes like the main focus, and that's not at all what I want the main focus to be. I love interpersonal relationships, and I like the idea of the conflict not being external but more internal, and you see these character struggles, and a lot of them I would hope that the reader would be able to connect with on some level and each character for me is like the different the nine different facets and subsects of my personality so red is like the very eager young inexperienced but full of like vigor and wants to just prove herself to the world so to me red was basically how i felt leaving high school going into college and then even leaving college and getting my career at cg cookie um, I just wanted to prove that I had value, I had worth, and that I could create something. And I think a lot of us feel that, especially when we're younger. And I feel like Red encapsulate that, encapsulates that for me. And then is also uh, doubles as one of my best friends, Kat, who is my assistant. Uh, she kind of shares that same eagerness and that readiness to try anything and to dive into something headfirst. And I want to explore that with Red. And Red will be an interesting character for me because I feel like her story won't necessarily be what we would think it would end up as. And I think that's something with all my characters. I want there to be an element of uh, not only surprise, but of growth that may not have been expected for that character. Why, thank you, Anastasia. Oh, I missed the end of that, but thank you for following. Because I think every character shouldn't just be a slot to fill on like the character uh, group necessities. And especially with fantasy RPGs, I feel like you see a lot of the same archetypes. And well, I, I mean, I do like some of them. Like in Final Fantasy X, obviously Oren's a stoic, older, uh, wiser character. And then you have someone like Riku who's like playful and fun. And, like, they obviously work because seeing them interact is really interesting. So I definitely want to play on that a little bit. But I also want to totally play with uh, what is expected in the stereotypes and what is actually going to be presented. And I think a good example of that is my character, Tracy. She is someone that will I'll just say is more of a uh, night worker. And she would initially come off to anyone as someone that is... Um, promiscuous and all the traits and judgments that come with that but I want Tracy to actually be 
one of my most intelligent characters, if not the most intelligent. She just chooses to live this nightlife and she knows what she's good at. She's good at being charming and um, aggressive. So Tracy will definitely have an interesting story. But Red in particular, I seem I feel like has connected with a lot of people because she isn't a typical one. She's not a typical girl in the sense that even my mom thought I it was a boy for a long time. <laughs> it's always funny talking to parents about the characters you create and like trying to explain to them who they are or why you created them. I don't think my mom fully understands, but um, I still love her a lot. But yes, Red is a girl. And I wanted to create this girl that the, the whole reason I created Red back in the day was a lot of artists were drawing females that were very sexualized, like ov like overtly sexualized. And it was something that never, I never felt I connected with. And it, I mean, obviously it doesn't interest me too much. And my whole premise of creating this girl character was having so many friends that were girls that wanted to see a girl that they could relate to and that would better represent who they felt they are on a day to day. So for me, Red is that girl. Red is that very ambitious girl looking to make a change in the world. And that's sort of how Red became a thing. Because Red was not one of those characters in my story way back in the day. She kind of came out of the blue after college when I decided I was going to add some new characters to better reflect my growth as a person and um, meeting different people from different cultures and backgrounds and how I wanted to implement that into swordplay so yeah and the world is definitely something i'm going to explore more i think anyone that does world building or has a world that you know they've created characters in it's always growing it's always developing and becoming deeper so as much as i would like to tell you more about the world it's like one of those things where i haven't locked in everything myself so i don't want to prematurely lock in something where it might not fit down the line and I don't want to have to paint it in um, is what they call it when you create something in your story and then it doesn't actually match with what you've already created so then you have to like force it to work and that will happen that's almost impossible to avoid but it's something I'm gonna do my best to avoid by not like locking myself into anything too early so yeah that's kind of where I'm going with my my world building right now. I like the idea that uh, it's it's still growing and I don't have anything concrete besides a few things, but I don't want to say them in case they change as well. Um, oh, hey, Brandon. I, I added the category. I am now in the art category for the first time. Or I think last week I did it too. Never mind. Um, Eric says, worked all day yesterday on a presentation. Then I looked through somebody's start on an exam and then my own exam paper. So today I went, nope on being productive today unless bribed <laughs> I, I i feel that sometimes um za says i think the christmas music creates a calm environment well wonderful but man says what did i study i studied game art and design because back in the day i thought i was gonna be a video game designer working at squaresoft and that was back when i was a kid and now that squaresoft is square enix and i have no real desire to be in the game industry i am uh, kind of an independent illustrator now. And I really want to create Swordplay as my illustrated book. I mean, I love doing the one-off illustrations that don't tie anything into Swordplay, and they're just, like, from my own imagination. And I'll, I'll never stop doing that, but I think this is something I need to do for myself. One, because, especially recently, I've noticed that a lot of artists that I look up to and artists that are creating their own books they seem to have stopped. It seems like they had other things that prevented them from doing um, their their books and what they believe in. And I see too many things nowadays that are just so focused on things that I'm not really interested in. Like I'm not really a, a porn type person. I don't really like um, that whole category of art. I can respect people that can do it. I just, it's not for me. And especially with, swordplay and what I want to show um, there's different things that I think I haven't really seen in a book of what I'm trying to create and part of it is like I have a few gay characters and I want to show relationships 
within that that aren't just over sexualized because I feel like that's all that it has become nowadays. And same with, I mean, there's a lot of stereotypes that I'm hoping to break with, at least in my, the way that I can give back to the world is showing a world that is different than the one we experience on a day to day. And maybe making younger kids or the next generation think, hey, I kind of like that idea. Or, yeah, you know, that's what I want to go down. Or, like, that inspires me to then build off of it. So I want to be one of the artists that hopefully will build that mentality, especially with the next generation. The older I get, the more I'm realizing it's, you know, it's important to give back to the next generation because they're the ones that are going to be kicking it after we're long gone. So you want to pass on as much as you can and hopefully you can pass on you know good morals and good traits and good things to live by and you know still let them make their own decisions on stuff but I think certain things like tolerance and accepting differences like things that should be just more common sense um, I, I see it more with the next generation too I see them being more inclusive and I, I love all of that so I want to contribute with the talent and skill that I have acquired over my life. And otherwise, I feel like it would be going to waste, you know? Um, see how... See La King says, Oh, I never show my OCs to most adults. <laughs> um, well, I think you should. It's one of those things where... I used to get really embarrassed talking about swordplay to people, and it's something that I've only more recently in like the last year or two been more comfortable with I think it's because we as artists sometimes feel so small and insecure about most things growing up that when we're adults and even if we become successful we still have that weird lingering sense that it's our art that people care about it's not so much us as a person and what we have to say and that can be true for a lot of people and it's something that you have to accept both your OCs they are literally a vessel for you to talk about something that you believe in or want to discuss or share. And I think that storytelling actually has a deeper premise than just this alternate reality that's a fantasy. I think it really can make people change opinions and kind of push their life or sway it in a different way. And I know like for me, and I'm sure a lot of people that are my age, uh, late 20s, uh, there was probably games growing up that really affected them. I know a lot of my friends, it would be like the original Zelda games. It was Majora's Mask or, um, oh, what was the other really big one? Why can't I not think of it right now? Uh, to be honest, I never played either. It wasn't a link to the past. Why can't I not think of it right now? Oh, that's so embarrassing. Ocarina of Time? Is that it? I think that's it. And... But for me, it was Final Fantasy X and Kingdom Hearts. And I know Kingdom Hearts has become borderline a joke nowadays. But if you play the original, which I did two weeks ago when I beat it, um, the original is actually more somber than I think a lot of people remember it. You literally end with uh, basically the main three characters, Riku, Kairi, and Sora, ending in different places in different worlds and having to sacrifice essentially their being able to see each other for the greater good and it was like that message hit me because that actually ended really sad and then final fantasy 10 if for those of you who haven't played it i guess spoiler alert for a second and why thank you k-bar for following uh it ends really sad and basically the whole game you're trying to save a character and in the end you find out that it was the main character all along that needed to be saved and it was, it really like affected me and it really changed the way I saw the world, especially with the religious undertones and the whole uh, problems that Titus was having with his father figure. It was just, it affected me more than I think it even should have. But being an artist, I feel like we're ultra sensitive to most things, <laughs> uh, especially when we're younger. So for me, I... I want to give back now that I'm older to the next generation the same way that I was affected when I was 11 and 12. And I feel like that really set the stage and course for the rest of my life in a small way, but it was definitely a big enough way to push me like into the art career and then into wanting to create my own story. 
So I want to, now that I'm older, I really want to inspire the next generation and give them something to work towards and hopefully better the following generation. And it's like this never ending cycle of giving back. And uh, I think it's kind of a goal of even being alive is to leave it better than when you came in. And, you know, as we get older, it's something that, you know, you think about more, but I've just been very okay with it. I've been okay with the idea of dying and moving on, but I really want to get stuff like this out in the world before I go. Because then it, I feel like at least I was able to contribute something, even if it's forgotten in 100 or 200 years. As long as I got it out, I can die happy. So now I am working uh, to make that dream happen before I kick the bucket. So will he make it? Only time will tell. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Um, remember to put Ad Von Art because I'm trying to quickly scroll here. Uh, Anastasia says, how do you feel with stressful feelings? Um, I'm one of those psychos that works through it. Uh, if you ever talk to any of my friends, uh, Sean will definitely tell you, I am one of those people who I tend to work more when I get more stressed. So I think that was probably something that I carried with me since I was younger and now that I'm adult, I just feel I know it's worth it and I know the reward. But I've also learned that it can kind of mess with your sense of friend and family and loved ones and like the relationships you have with them. So I'm learning how to pull back and kind of dial it down just enough where I can still get a bunch of work done but not feel like I'm ignoring all the people in my life that I, I truly care about, which has been a good, good lesson for me to learn, honestly. And I think it's something that I needed to learn. Um, what else? How else do I deal with stress? It's weird because like drawing to me is so therapeutic. I always, I find it very strange talking with an artist when they are stressed because to me, I'm like, well, just go draw. But for them, it's, it's more complicated than that. And the, the way that I've learned to kind of talk with people now is, or what from I've, what I've heard that works for other people is take a break. Really do something for yourself. If you like watching movies, go watch a movie. Like take yourself to a movie theater and pay for a movie that you will just see. I've learned that people tend to be less stressed when they are doing the things that they love to do and they are actively trying to better themselves in a happier way. So mindfulness was something that was very much taught at the workshop that I was at in, in mid-November this year, the one fantastic workshop. And that's something that I've been, I guess, like hyper aware of the past few weeks and something that I want to continue sharing with you guys on how you can work while still feeling, or not feeling guilty about not working, how to be there for family and friends while not giving up your, your career. And finding that balance is so crucial, but it will mean making sacrifices. Like uh, Morbacher or Pete, he wakes up, at, I think he said six every day or 5.30, and he, he paints for like two and a half hours roughly. And the rest of the day, it's free. He'll go get brunch with his wife, he'll wait for his kids to get home, and then they'll all you know hang out together, and then they'll go to bed. And then that happens every day. So he has like a two and a half hour work day every day. And what's weird is I've been adapting that. So now my work day is three hours long. I usually wake up uh, when Josh wakes up and then I'll fall back asleep for an hour and then I'll wake up. So like 9, 30, 10 and I'll draw for like three hours. Why, well, thank you for whoever just followed. Who was that? Let's see. Oh, I missed it. Sorry again. For anyone that follows, sometimes I miss it. Or wait, Bomb Bajorn. I think that's how you say it. Thank you for following uh, it's very weird, but I, I time myself now. I have one hour dedicated to a swordplay piece, one hour dedicated to the collector piece, the one with all the arms, and then one to my hollow queen. So a lot of you might be wondering, well, how the hell do you finish anything if you only work three hours a day? Well, every Tuesday is when my assistant comes over and that's when I'll like focus on signing up for cons or emailing things or shipping originals out or whatever it might be 
And that is like my actual work day. But the rest of the time, it's those three hours. But if I ever choose to work more than that, it's like I get to, I choose to work more than that. So I'm still working about five to eight hours every day, but only three of them do I feel like are mandatory and the rest are me choosing to do it because I genuinely enjoy doing it. I think that's the difference for a lot of us is sometimes drawing can become a chore. And I think that's where a stress then come in, can come in. But maybe you try out my strategy of like, okay, for the next hour, I'm working on this. I'm not going to take breaks. I'm not going to distract myself with other things. I'm just going to do this because you know what? It's just an hour. I can give it just an hour. And that's how I feel with the three things that I'm working on. I just keep thinking it's just an hour. I can, I can give an hour. And then if after those three hours, if I really am just not feeling the drawing that day, I won't draw the rest of the day, you know, and I won't feel guilty because I was only obligated to draw three of those hours of the day. And I think that's been helping me a lot in terms of finding out how I work when I work best. And I used to think I only worked well at night and I still do work, I think, really well at night. But I'm also learning how to work during the day, which is something I've never really done before, but I'm learning to do. All right, I think for this stream, oops, <laughs> I'm going to try to render out Red's face quite a bit. But for those of you who may have seen me draw on this Twitch before, maybe have been following me for a while, you know that I, I like to have more of a foundation build up first, and then I go in and try to rock it out with some harsher values and tighter lines. And this is just a way that I've learned to draw over the years that fits me and suits best. So I'm not saying this is the proper way to do it because a lot of artists, they just kind of go in, especially if like you're an ink artist, usually you might lay down a pencil drawing first as like foundation, but some artists just go for it and it works really well for them. So this is my process, this is what works for me, but that is definitely not something that is 100% gonna work for you. You gotta kind of find it on your own, honestly. Also, I think I made Red's hair too long. There we go. I almost want to give her like a lazy bun in the back. I just feel like Red's one of those people that even during like formal settings still has some lack of formality to her and part of it is like she doesn't care I mean she does care and wants to be taken seriously but I think a part of her just doesn't even realize sometimes what that means to be formal which I kind of like about her And also my camera's like on a tilt right now because I'm trying to draw on like a tilted easel at the moment. So if you're wondering why it looks slightly out of perspective. Um, Za says, call me Za, pronounce Z like the Z from Zebra and just A. Zay. So Zay? Like Z from the Z from Zebra and just A. Z-A? You might have to help me with that one. <laughs> um, Buttman says, I just finished studying game art design. I'm glad I'm not the only one realizing it's not for me. I was feeling really guilty. No. you. The more the more you grow through life, the more that your priorities and desires change. Like For me, I have less than zero desire to get into the game industry nowadays. But I'm glad I went through that experience because I learned a lot from other people that I went to school with. And when you go to school with people that are passionate, I feel like it's so hard not to get that rubbed off on you and have that influence your work from that point forward then. So yeah, I mean, guess oh, I was going to take a drink from this. Yeah, let me just... Uh, you want to surround yourself with, even if you're not at school, with people that are clearly passionate. It doesn't even have to be drawing necessarily, 
you just want people with that energy because that's what kept me very much vitalized and uh, pushing forward because I wanted to prove myself to the people I was going to class with. And the best way to, to do that was to have this like unspoken level of competition between everyone. And it was, it was healthy though. There's a difference between unhealthy and uh, healthy competition. If you realize like you're helping, like you're giving tips, you're sharing information, uh, that's like a healthy competition because you want to be the best, but you also want to um, beat the best, essentially. I well, thank you, Rushmore, for following. And it's kind of hard to explain if you, you're not in the scenario, but essentially, like I'm in a big competition right now with Pui Che or Pui Illustrated Online. Him and I do a lot of conventions together. We started doing them at the same time. And we always share our numbers with each other. And we always try to like one up who did better. And it's not because money is our main goal. It definitely helps sustain our lifestyle and keeps us afloat. But for us, it's like, it's fun to have someone to then force you to look at your booth or your products or what you're doing and try to make it better. And like to continually make it better rather than just settling. I think settling is one of the great kind of failures of an artist is when you you look at what you've done and you decide that this is enough i have i have done enough i am done i'm just gonna keep at this stage and level for the rest of my life i actually find it really disheartening when i come across an artist like that especially one that i feel like was really pushing the boundary of where art can go and how far they can push themselves on either a technical or a creative ability well thank you daves for following and I don't want to be one of those artists. I never want to be known as one of the artists that almost made it. Or like they they were on the right track, but then they fell on the last lap, you know. So that's something I'm always a little too aware of. All right, I'm going to give Red a nice little gradient of the shaved part of her head going up. Kind of create this cool contrast then with her skin tone being so light but I want to make it too dark that it looks like she actually has hair because it's supposed to be shaved um oh yeah let's see here Luva says I wanted to be a concept artist for Final Fantasy and now I finish a concept art course I realize I don't want it because there are a lot of concept art techniques mostly required in the industry that I don't like at all like matte painting and now I don't know what to do with my life uh, that's okay, Luva. It's one of those things where I was a little unsure too. And CG Cookie, I got that job out of school. I wasn't necessarily looking to teach and it was never one that even felt comfortable with anyone watching me draw and, <laughs> and look where I am now. But I was handed this opportunity and I ran with it. So my advice to you is don't try to plan too much and take the opportunities that come to you and do the very best that you can because you won't feel at fault or like you're doing anything wrong if you're giving it your best effort, even if it's something that you didn't necessarily know you would enjoy doing or like doing. And trust me, I've had jobs where I hated most of the job. So like I worked at a seafood restaurant, Papa Do's, back when I was in college and I was an oyster shucker. So for like four to six hours, every time I had a shift, I would just be shucking oysters and sticking them in ice. And that was my life for a little time. But I, you know, I gave it my all. I proved that I can do it and do it well. And then they um, promoted me to Sushi Boy. So then I was, you know, rolling sushi for a little while. And I did apparently a, a nice enough job decorating the sushi plates that they then promoted me to Dessert Boy. And then I was decorating cakes. And with the cakes, I had fun because I could add little spirals and I would add um, fun little techniques on them to make the just the desserts look more fun. And it's one of those things where I didn't have to go that extra mile. And I noticed other people too that those are the people you want to be. And I think I looked up to my brother who, he's a construction worker now, but he always gave it his all. Like when he built me a Beanie Baby house back when I was a kid as a present, he made like a two-story cardboard house with working electricity so the rooms had lights and bunk beds with like sleeping uh, mats in them. It was just, 
something that I think it has run in my family and me being influenced at such a young age, especially even my sister, who's also an overachiever. Um, those were my influencers in my life. And because of them, I think I was able to really push myself in the art field. And I'm really thankful for that. So I'm realizing more and more that you really want to surround yourself with people that seem to be driven. It doesn't even matter what they do. Cause like my brother, I have no interest in construction working. I think I would actually be horrible at it, but just his ambition really inspired me. So be, be very aware of who you're surrounding yourself with and are they inspiring you or do you feel like they are complaining or making excuses a lot? You want to be around the people that are not only making ideas, but then acting upon them. Because remember, ideas are cheap. You can get them for a dime a dozen. It's the people that actually try to make something out of them that those are the ones you want to stick with. Anyways, let me move on here. Jim says, now that we've You've been on the other side of the fence for a good year or so. How does being an independent artist compare to working for the man, quote unquote? Um, to me, it's it's like night and day. I mean, I loved the people at CG Cookie, and they gave they definitely gave me my platform early in my career, where I was able to use that then to kind of push myself into this independent lifestyle. But I would never go back to it. I think now that I've been independent, um, you kind of realize how you spend your money, I think, more. I think too often when we have a full-time job, and now knowing, being really close with someone who has a full-time job and how they spend their money, it's almost like you're working for the paycheck. And for me, it's like I'm working for my passion. And something I learned this year was a byproduct of that is financial gain. But that is not the goal. Where a lot of people that are working for the man, the goal is to support themselves financially. It's not so much whatever the actual job may be that they are passionate about. And that's the difference. So taking that leap of faith was incredibly scary. And I can't recommend it to everyone because I know the feeling of feeling financially unstable and not sure of how I'll make my income. I did a lot of pre-planning. I'm definitely someone that likes to plan ahead. And I was able to kind of figure out how would I be able to make a living not having a steady paycheck. And I took I took that jump. And it's been working. And I'm very thankful for that. But it's never secure. That's the other thing that I'm a little aware of too. Like even though I did pretty well this year, that doesn't mean I'm going to do really well next year. I have to like keep pushing myself, which... Thankfully, I feel like I'm that type of person that would continue down that path. But there's always going to be a little stress, that little pressure, you know, just nagging at me a little bit like, hey, if this doesn't work out, you won't be able to pay your mortgage this month. And I'm definitely aware of that. I'm very, I'm, I'm very aware, but it, it, it doesn't compare. I would never go back to a full-time job. Even if they paid me double what I'm making as an independent artist, I wouldn't do it. Um, let's see here. It was Ocarina of Time. Thank you. That's the right one. Um, Za says, I know what you mean. I'm sensitive as well, even though I sometimes appear the opposite. Mm-hmm. Eric says, Kingdom Hearts is full of sad moments, but the colors and characters seem to trick people. Yeah. And the fact that, like, your char your side characters are Donald and Goofy. Um, Brandon says, what do you think of my main character? She's a badass alcoholic demon hunter. None of that overly sexual stuff. <laughs> uh, well, basically, when I look at, like, main characters, to me, that is such a branch of who the artist is themselves so i feel like there's a part of you that feels like a badass alcoholic demon hunter and that's why i feel like all my characters are like these sensitive tropes <laughs> like sometimes i feel i fall into that so yeah i think that does fit you um za says yep the way you just pronounced it okay i'm gonna go with za then um pro bmfk says why do you think artists fall to that um, fall to what? Sometimes with your questions, be a little more specific because it takes me a while to like scroll down because I, I jab a lot. So it might, I might lose track of where the conversation was. 
But unless if you mean like they fall into feeling uncomfortable talking about their own stuff. I think it's because we as artists, at least for my my experiences, I went to art because that was my way of being heard. I couldn't fully express myself through the language that were that is spoken, so I found a language of a visual medium to help express how I feel and I've created this craft now where I've really invested my life and my abilities into it. So my technical skill has kind of caught up with my ambitions and my creative ability to want to be different. And I think it's so much easier now for me to express myself in my own life to a person because I feel confident now. That took a long time. And going from a weird, shy kid in grade school that is almost too aware of how other people are treating one another and how I'm being seen in the ranks ranks of grade school uh, to someone that who I really just don't care. I don't care if someone doesn't like me. I, it used to really bother me um, wanting to be maybe not even liked, just accepted. And I never really was bullied ever in my life, but I think I was just really good at kind of not pulling the strings or like not being a nuisance to anyone. I always just kind of kept to myself. And even in high school, like I would have been such an easy target because I was in the art room like six hours of the day, especially my senior year. And I, I ate lunch in the art room. I was definitely like the stereotype art kid, but I never really was made fun of by the popular kids. They actually thought I was really cool because I was able to draw well. And maybe that's another reason why I am so drawn to drawing because it was my way of being accepted in social scenarios. And I I don't know. It's a weird thing to look back at and try to anal- like analyze that kind of stuff. But for me, art has definitely been very therapeutic and my way of being able to find myself and not only help me accept myself, because I think I did kind of accept myself pretty early on in life, but then have others possibly try to see my point of view with things. And yeah, I'm just kind of living off that now. Um, okay, Za meant, I meant Za-e, one, Z, Z-e, Z-e, is that right? Z-e? I think I can get it, Z-e. Eric says, I think the question was regarding artists settling on their ability and skills, and oh, why they do that. <laughs> you want me to be brutal? I'll spill the tea on this one. I think artists settle because they become comfortable with where they're at and the money is good. So I look at my own career and my own, I guess, brand, if I want to even go that direction. I could easily just draw girls with demon horns and have that be like the forefront of everything I draw. And yeah, I'd probably get good social responses and I would get a lot of likes because I feel like I'm playing the game, not because I'm trying to be authentic, but because I know what's popular or what is popular with my work. And... I just, I don't want to be that artist. I don't want to be seen by someone like myself when I was 19 and 20, when I was like overly critical and like, who was I at that time? But I still, that still affects me thinking, I don't want to be that artist that I feel settled. Why, thank you, Squirrel, for subscribing. Oh, wait, I get to watch it drop. (gasps) Heart explosion. Uh, and I, I don't want this to feel like a call out to other artists because there are definitely other artists that I definitely feel are playing the game right now. But you know what? That used to really get to me. And now that I'm older, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to respect the hustle. Even though I don't necessarily think what they're doing now is good or really pushing themselves as an artist. They're making good money and they seem to be happy and they're drawing what they want to draw. So I'm going to let them draw what they want to draw rather than like shove my opinion down their throat. 
Why, thank you, Sammy, for subscribing. You guys are too nice. And f focusing on yourself and being what I call selfish, like, I think it's good to be selfish. And it doesn't mean that you are, like, <laughs> you're not letting someone share some of your food when they don't have any. Like, that's a different kind of selfish. That's actually, like, cruel. But the selfish I'm talking about is when you're focusing on what makes you happy, what you want to do with your career, and not letting other people influence so much that you kind of lose your own voice. So be selfish. Stop caring about what other people think. And that's really helped my career explode because I have had so many people tell me that I won't make it as a pencil artist. You have to do color. And even furthermore, when I was in college, everyone thought my stuff was too feminine, that my stuff would not make it because it was, quote unquote, too gay to be, uh, what was it called? To be, I think it was marketable. It was something just really dumb. And yeah, like college kids can be, especially our kids, can be like really judgmental. And you know what? I'm one of those people where I took that and I ran with it. I took, I, I'm taking your insults. I'm taking what you are trying to put me down on. And I am actually making it something that changed me for the better. You think I draw Justin Bieber too much? Let me draw five more. You know, like I had that kind of mentality to me. And being more stubborn, I think, led to me creating work that felt more authentic. And it felt more like I wasn't letting other people push me in the direction I was allowing myself to walk in the direction I freely chose to go in. And even with swordplay right now, like I don't need to be making this to be successful as an artist. If anything, this might be hindering me financially because I could just be drawing another pretty girl with horns and sell the original, make prints of it, but I wouldn't feel like it was right. And it doesn't mean that I can never draw a pretty girl with horns again, but it just means I have to Sorry, I drank way too much uh, vegan chocolate milk as I go to sip a little bit more. Um, it just means that if I'm feeling like I genuinely want to draw a girl with horns, yeah, then I'm going to do it. But if I'm feeling like I'm doing it just because I feel I have to, that's where the problem becomes for me. And there's a lot of artists where I think they have tremendous technical ability, but I feel like they fall into just doing what's popular or what will make them money. And it really does make me sad. Or used to. Now I've learned to be like, you know what? I'm going to let you keep doing that. I'm going to focus on what I want to do. And last note on this. Um, even with like this drawing, the one with all the hands and arms, this isn't me just like clocking in for the day. This is really difficult for me. <laughs> like, this, Even though people think I, I just am good at drawing hands, like it's still, it can be really difficult and I'm not trying to play it safe. I'm trying to push myself. I don't even know if this will look fully good when in the end when it has 300 hands and arms on it. But you know what? I'm willing to try. And as long as I have that mentality of I'm willing to at least go for it, then that's, I can be, I can sleep well with myself at night. I can go to bed knowing that I'm not just trying to cash in on being an artist. I'm still trying to find ways to push myself and to have my voice be heard and hopefully inspire other people. So yeah, sorry that that got a little um, serious for a second there. Do -do -do. Uh, C. Molone says, you're really right about surrounding yourself with people with that energy, but I feel like I'm one of those people with no energy. I'm not able to push myself. You can. Uh, you're, the more that you tell yourself that you can't, the more that you'll believe it. So you really have to start focusing on the words that you're using to describe yourself. Why, thank you, Germs Draws, for following. Instead of saying, you're not able to push myself, you can say, I haven't been able to find methods of being able to push myself. Because there are definitely methods to do that. You just haven't found them yet. And that's not a bad thing. There's a lot of times where we feel lost in life or we feel like we can't pick ourselves up. But then all of a sudden we'll like watch a YouTube video or one of our friends will say something to us and it like, it's kind of snaps us out of that mentality and it's like, you know what, I can do this. And you kind of pick yourself up. But too often we find ourselves like waiting for that moment. So I'm telling you right now, like try to be more active and search out ways to do it. And a lot of that, like my, my best friend Kat, she talks about how she uses YouTube 
admittedly, a lot for her uh, wellness. And it's helped her because then you find tricks and tips of ways to kind of move on and ways to grow up in a way from things that you feel are holding you back. So yeah, just be more mindful of, am I actively trying to find ways of uh, pushing myself or am I actively trying to be more energetic or am I kind of leaning into being on the lazier side or leaning into the sadness? And I totally understand where you're coming from because back in like 2014, I was really feeling sad. I was feeling really sad actually. And I would lean into it a little bit and I would listen to my Lana Del Rey on blast and I would think that I was the only one that understood my point of view and I would never find anyone that would love me. Like it was very dramatic. I was a very dramatic 24 year old. But once I was heartbroken by the person I thought I was going to be with the rest of my life, I channeled that energy into, it was kind of spiteful if I was honest with you guys. And I created my first sketchbook, my 2013, 2014 sketchbook, the smaller one. And I poured all my energy into that. I was angry, I was frustrated, and I would just sit in my basement. I would be editing these photos. I'd be like, mm -hmm. be listening to my Lana Del Rey, and I'm just clicking furiously on editing. And I made a Kickstarter, and it worked. And not only did it work, but it actually worked really well. And it was at that moment that I realized what I like to call a delling a situation. It's where you take a tragedy and turn it into gold. And that's not to say that you should act be actively looking for tragedies, but like look at your life and your experiences and put that into your work and be authentic with it. I remember the drawing that really pushed me back into pencil stuff was the thing that you see as my profile picture everywhere. That drawing originally had a quote next to it. And this was during the time I was really heartbroken and I was still doing a lot of digital work. So to do pencil was very bizarre. And I think I wrote, I would rather think that the friend I had and loved died rather than pretend the friendship we share now is the same. And I shared that everywhere. And it was my way of like being, I felt really vulnerable, but the response was so good. I felt like I had a lot of people being able to relate to that feeling and then from there, it was just, it was so easy to open up this can of worms of like these feelings that I wanted to express. Uh, but it, I never wanted to attack the person either. I just, this is how I was feeling and this is how I wanted to get it out. So uh, I know what you mean by feeling like you don't have much energy and you're not able to push yourself. But I can also tell you, you may very well surprise yourself with how much energy and capability you do have. You're just not allowing yourself to do it so find your way of whatever that hyper focus listen to your Lana Del Rey on blast and just go for it and even if you fail or even if the project fails you at least tried and that's more than most people can say um doo -doo -doo. hey Tawny how are you doing glad to see you on here are you going to color these yep that is something I hear all the time and I know that I've talked to you Tawny too about that's Something that we'll just have to deal with the rest of our lives. Whatever. No, I'm not going to color it. <laughs> um, let's see here. Brandon says, plus, even if they are making really good money doing something that is very much the same or almost mechanical for them, why thank you, common boy, for following. You never know that might have college bills or a baby on the way or want a house and they have to make the money they know they can make. I feel like sometimes doing something super different or something that like that could almost hurt your pockets, you know? Yeah. It's very true. Uh, when your goal is financial, I feel like you do turn to things that you know will make you money. And I, this is where I get into arguments with people. Or not, or just discussions. I don't argue anymore. I, I discuss. Because I, I, I never get heated anymore to the best of my ability. Because you have to respect other people's opinions and where they're coming from. And it was actually, I was talking to Corey Godby about this a little bit further. On why, actually him and... Justin Gerard on why they sell their originals so cheap because in my mind they could be selling them for like triple the price and it was funny talking with them on how their goal isn't financial based and 
it was very enlightening talking to both of them because they have a very almost opposite opinion of my other friend, Pete, who is very smart and biz- very savvy in the business world. And for him, he sees it like I see it, like making money is kind of like a game. It's like Monopoly. It's not like you play to win. You play because it's fun. And that's what I try to see money as. It's like, it's fun, but it's not my goal. But then talking with Corey and even Justin, like their goal is to create work that feels good. And it's not to make the most dime at a convention. And I, I definitely have been thrown off for a little bit this year, trying to figure out what kind of an artist do I want to be and what kind of work do I want to create. And I think I've kind of found myself through it, but it's been so interesting hearing other people talk about financial gain not being their goal because of how many artists I talk to where that's the only thing they care about. And even a lot of people in my own crew, like that's very much all that's talked about. And it's just interesting hearing the other side of the story. So yeah, I, I can understand when people have to make payments and stuff, but then does that affect their art? I would say 100% yes. And is that a good thing? That's where it becomes very much opinion-based. In my opinion, I would say no. But I'm also living with five people. I don't have kids. I'm pretty stable right now, so it's easy for someone like me to say that. But And I'm also very aware that I could empathize with someone with a few kids and a mortgage payment, and they have all these kind of debts on their shoulders. And I could see myself, even if I had those same debts, resorting to at least a few times a month creating pieces that you know will generate some income so yeah and it's good to even if you have a set opinion like I feel very very set on a lot of the things that I believe in in life but I'm I'm always willing to listen to the other side and at least willing to put my my own opinion even into the mix and who knows what opinion may come out of that that I'll stick with because I think if you kind of have this attitude that throughout my life I'm going to grow and learn and change as I learn. That's a good attitude to have. And I I try to remind myself that. Anyways, uh, Eric says, that sounds like Tetsuya Nomura when he designed the character Lulu. I love the design of Lulu. I give that a 10 out of 10. I give it a belt out of belt because that character, actually most of the ones in 10, are so unique and so weird that they're iconic. And You can say all you want that like Waka's hair is ridiculous or that Titus's clothes don't make any sense or that Lulu's belt dress is ridiculous. Yeah, but you know what? We're talking about it and we're still talking about it almost 20 years after the game came out. So think about that. (laughs) Um, I think the best character designs aren't often the most practical, which is weird because even for like my swordplay characters... Why, thank you, Germs Draws, for subscribing. Hey, hey, we get to watch the bomb again. Um, I try to be more practical with the way that I, I draw my character designs. As much as I like very weird, unique aesthetic designed clothing, uh, I find myself leaning towards somewhere in the middle where it feels still unique enough, but also feels practical, where it feels believable, wearable and tangible even with like white with their hair that's why i always try to have it in different styles so it could be like before she came to the dock she didn't have shaved sides and i want to show that and i want to show it in a ponytail and then when she starts training everyone else is getting i can't fit the paper everyone else is getting the side of their hair shaved because it's custom for the knights in this world but then she does a double dutch braid you know and then in this one it's more relaxed and it's almost like curled as if she like curled it herself and then in this one it's her more natural it's just like back in a ponytail it's kind of messy and it it makes your characters feel more believable so I definitely have that as something important to me is something I want it to feel believable I guess but I also look at character designs like Lulu and I'm like that's my inspiration Even though you might not see it directly, like I'm not adding 100 belts to my characters, it heavily influences me. Uh, Let's see here. Hey, Sean's here. Says, I can't make that cyber bully about lifting because the chat won't let me. Oh, no! Um, Basically, (laughs) the joke 
one of the things Sean and I have. I guess it's more of an inside joke. Actually, no. You know what? We'll keep that between us, Sean. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think you're allowed to type that. Oh, Sean, you're amazing. Um, ZA says, this is just my own thought, but if I may share it, I think a great life needs to have dark times and sad times because that's what will give birth to the happiest moments. I think of it as contrast, and I also compare it to space, like how background is all dark, but there are stars in there representing happy moments that exist as points. Well, that's a really great way to look at it. And, I mean, you hear so many philosophy lectures, or, talk, or at least I do, about how you can't have... You can't know happiness unless you've known sadness and how opposites rely on each other. And that's why the world being in a balance is actually so relevant and prominent because we rely on that balance to sustain ourselves. And yeah, I honestly, I don't think I would experience the happiness I am now without experiencing how sad I used to be a few years ago. And like, even now, I'm so thankful for, and I even, I, I wrote this person a letter two years ago, how thankful I am that they, I had them in my life because they've really taught me a lot about who I am. They changed me. They molded me a little bit, and I feel like my skin is so thick now. Like, it really takes a lot to get me upset or angry, and the thing that I still, I carry over from my parents though is to never not trust or not love another person because that's when you kind of lose at life. And uh, I share that same mentality with like Marcus Limonis, who is my business idol. And he talks about how even with business deals, there will be a lot that go wrong, but that doesn't mean that it'll ever affect the way he looks at a new young business owner and give them your full respect and trust. Because if you don't, you're building on an unstable foundation. So I think about that when I'm like building a new relationship with another person or even a friendship, whatever it might be, to go in fully and be smart enough to know when to pull back. I think protecting yourself is important, but I think there needs to be a level of openness too to actually build a relationship from. And I think that's important too. Let's see here. Sarah says, at some point this year, I was going to have surgery and I was super anxious and scared because I would not be able to walk for months and I had friends that weren't there for me and I was really sad and angry and that was the break point for me to try to change my art and goals and I'm trying so hard right now to go for it. I'm having a lot of fun, but I have doubt sometimes. I believe in you so much, Sarah. <laughs> I need you to know like that is very valiant of you. I want you to continue doing that. And yeah, there will be sad times. There will be plenty of sad times, especially if you feel like your friends weren't there for you when you may not have been able to walk, really. And when you stop relying so much on other people, you kind of find yourself. So I think you're doing great. Keep doing exactly what you said you're doing. Um, Simoleond says, okay, I'm a little teary. You got me bang on. You're right. I guess he needs the courage to face what comes be it failure or success oh well, i don't i don't mean to make you feel teary unless if it was like a good a good tear like you needed that that tear to escape your life that tear was like holding anxiety and you let it go in the form of a tear <laughs> uh, yeah i think the thing that i've been able to do with not only this twitch stream but even like people i meet at cons and i think why sometimes people get a little emotional. Like I've had a lot of people tell me they cry for my books. It's just because I feel I'm, I'm blunt, but I'm blunt with like a, a kindness, but I'm very firm and I don't let people slide with excuses or reasons why they can't be doing something or why they don't believe in themselves. It's like, stop blaming other people for your shortcomings. And the more that you take your life by the reins and you're like no this is my life i'm setting the chart and course where i want to go you i i promise you'll be so much happier because even if you fail at least you failed on your terms you didn't fail on someone else's terms telling you of what direction to go because that feels awful imagine not even following the direction or your heart of where it wants to go and then and you, then you also fail that's awful that feels awful um, let's see here. 
Hemlock says, hey, Hemlock, how are you doing? I'm afraid that if I end up, I'm afraid that if I end up being an artist, as my job will lose the magic. Oof, mispress the keyboard. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, you're, you're going to be fine. Like, I look at your art, and I'm like, you're, you're so talented. Like, you just got to keep producing work. You're, you're, you're literally, the biggest problem you have right now is quantity, which I'm sure for you, it's like, okay, I'll just keep working at that because your art, it'll, you'll be fine. And I, I think about that when I, I think about the artists that I've met this year. You're one of the artists that I just, I just know is going to make it. So just keep focusing on it. Your art won't lose the magic unless if you allow it to, which based on what I've seen, I don't feel like you're the type of person to do that either. So yeah, don't, don't do that. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Don't do it because you're the only one that can make your art lose its magic. And you know, I think about that too with some of the art I do. Sometimes when I feel like I am being lazier, if I am just checking in for the day, I don't feel good about it, you know? And I think the more experience you get and the more technical ability you acquire, there is a level of pressure of you should be doing better works. And I don't think I should be just drawing simple pretty girls as like my main thing anymore because I have a technical ability that allows me a wider range of capabilities. And because of this opportunity that I've kind of worked for my whole life, why not create stuff that really showcases what I've learned throughout my life and my career rather than just create something that will generate likes? I think it's it's good to know both. I think you should have a mindset for both as an artist, especially in the modern age. But I think acting upon both is also important. And there's times where, yeah, you need to create, let's say, a new print for a con and you only have three days. I totally get it. You need to create something that may not be your avant-garde piece, but it's something that you need to make to sustain your living. I can respect that. But as long as you're also trying to better yourself on the other plane as well. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard me say this many times before. The best artists, in my opinion, are the ones that have a great technical ability and a great creative ability and being like original and then having a marriage between the two. I think the artists that are really original and creative, but also technically like above and beyond, those are the artists I want to look up to and I want to aspire to be. And that's why look at the greats of yesteryear. Look at the Mukas, the Da Vinci's, the, the Harry Clark's. Look at these artists that spent their whole life really, really creating work that wasn't just cashing it in or didn't really feel like they were just clocking in for the day. It, you know, it, there's such a difference in an artist that you can just tell when they aren't really putting themselves in their work. They're just creating something what they think is popular. And I'm going to be actually really honest with you. Uh, this is something I haven't even told anyone. Uh, I was looking at uh, when I wanted to generate more followers. I was like, why don't I look at the artists that have the most followers or the followers that, or the artists that I think I am similar to in some way or I want to be. And let me look at what their top three most liked images are. And then I'll pick from that pile of ones that I think I could draw similarly or like I could be inspired from and draw something in my style. And I decided not to do this. One, because it felt crazy inauthentic. But two, it's like you're no longer looking to like better yourself. You're looking to cash in on someone else's success. And thankfully, I have enough um, <laughs> of a, you know, a good moral stance to not do something like that ever. But yeah, I definitely was like looking at their top three images and trying to decipher why is this their best image and why do people like this more than their more technical prowess pieces. And I've realized that you can't judge how good a piece is based on a drawing that literally people see for a half second as they're scrolling through their phone when they're waking up. That does not determine a good piece from a bad piece. That determines the most likable it is. And oftentimes that means like how clear and easy is it to see on a two inch screen when you're waking up at 7am. 
and that's no longer I mean it'll always be a part of me unfortunately because I think I am too aware of social media and how that affects my career <laughs> but I'm no longer going to let that affect what I create in the future as much as I used to like yeah you know what I'm going to do a drawing with 300 hands and arms in it I don't care if it doesn't do well on Instagram because you know what it's going to do well for me and how I feel about myself as an artist and that means more to me right now in my life than generating the most amount of likes that I possibly can Anyways, I am ranting. Let me continue. I'll look for more comments here because I think I'm way behind. Uh, Zungo says, everything we're talking about today is so current for me. I'm changing a lot of stuff in my life. Actually, this week was seriously busy with thinking about my artistic goals, and I came to understanding that I need to change places where I work. And tomorrow I'm going to write to studio I really want to work in. Oh, I'm going to write to a studio. Okay. People here are so creative and passionate, and I really want this environment for me. Being here with all of you constantly shows me how amazing it is to have that passion. Yeah. And that's kind of why I'm pouring more of myself into the Discord, because I want to create a community more of these passionate people. And I'm so thankful for the other artists that I went to school with in college and the artists that I live with today, because they inspire me. They keep this train fueled and... Sometimes when I'm running low on my own fuel, I feel like they give me a loan. They give me like some of their fuel. They're like, hey, I have so much. Here, have some of mine until you hit a fuel station. And usually a fuel station for me, I like metaphors. If you haven't noticed, that's all I do. That's all I think in is metaphors. A fuel station for me is like when you go to Spectrum Fantastic Art Live or you have, you meet like your art hero and it just like injects you with inspiration. And to me, that's fuel. And usually when we're running roll on fuel, it's because we haven't really had an interesting experience or occasion that's happened to us recently. And that's why I always first recommend trying to change up your pattern of what you're doing. And more often than not, that includes just like going outside. <laughs> I think too many of us are locked indoors and we do it to ourselves. So go outside. Uh, try to look at a tree and like really look at it. Look at all the little nuances that it, it carries with it. And think of how it's been around longer than you have and what it's seen that you probably will never see. And especially like in a really old tree. Imagine one that's like 150 years old. That's literally, like for me, I'm, I'm basically 30. So that's five times the amount of life it has lived than myself. And the things that it probably has seen in the changing landscape of those 120 years that I wasn't alive had to be so drastic. So yeah, try to change up your routine. Um, Sarah says, thank you so much for those words. You are welcome, Sarah. Keep pushing. Tigel says, what's Red's birth name? You think I'm going to give it to you that easily? Come on now. Red's not her real name for those of you who don't know, but I'm not going to share what her real birth name is. Um, ZA says, I also think you have to accept that there will be times where you'll be totally alone and you'll just have to go through it alone, but it's not really that sad. If anything, it sounds motivating to me. It depends on your perception, but it definitely takes time to get used to, to accept it. So I'm not judging anyone either because when you start empathizing, you kind of stop judging. Oh yeah. But I also think it's a lot easier to talk about how you can push through and like when you don't have anyone, you can totally pull through. And I think I can say that a little more now because I, I went through that. But when you're actually in that phase, it it's soul crushing. It really, I mean, there were a lot of nights. You got to remember, I've been single for 28 years. And by the time you hit 25, you kind of start to feel the pressure. And then by 27, I mean, you really think, you start to accept that maybe you will be alone forever. And then 28, I would just, I was kind of sad and it, I just got so tough skin and I got so thick skin that I was just okay with it. And I was okay with, you know, the person I was and maybe I will be alone for the rest of my life. And I, I accepted it. And it was at that moment that I actually met someone. And that's such a weird, like what a weird thing. Like life, you're so weird. Um, but I understand what it's like going through those down times and feeling like you are alone. And it is hard to build yourself out of that hole that sometimes you dug yourself <laughs> in the first place. And I think I think you said that you were very young. And 
I I literally have the same mentality you did when I was 16 or 17. Literally, not, I was so bullheaded. Nothing could drag me down. And keep that as long as you can. And the other thing is never lose it even after you experience like heartache and pain. And that's something that I will never give up. I think my ambition and my... I mean, because a lot of people, when they're my age, they start thinking about extent, existential, you know, things about, like, does life even matter? You know, we're just a blip in this universe. Like, they, they you go start going down that path. And the conclusion I came to is I don't and will never know the answers to, you know, is there a God? What is life uh, worth? And the way that I've answered it for myself is I don't know but I'm going to make the most of the life that I've been given. And that's all I can do. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I'm okay with just making art for the rest of my life, having maybe a small family, having really close friends that I can enjoy having Halloween parties that are extravagant and traveling the country to go to these cons. Like to me, that's a life worth living. And I'll probably never understand what the actual meaning of life is. But to me, that's a pretty good enough reason to wake up in the day with a smile. So yeah, hope that helps. Um, ZA says, and I also want to make a story which teaches people that don't think of dark times as granted or anything but just temporary. That's a very good story to tell. Um, Digital says, did someone say fool station? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> you might have to help me out there, Tish. Um, ZA says, I know what you mean. I think in metaphors a lot as well. Jerem says, after meeting you last WonderCon, chatting for a tiny bit, I decided to actually try and make some art somewhere. So I just wanted to say thanks for that little nudge. It totally started a domino effect and jump-started my motivation. So truly, thank you. That is awesome to hear. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, hey, Jay Bolter says, yo, salutes. Salute back. Um, doo -doo -doo. ZA says, yeah, I am in a relation do you mean relationship you might have to uh, better define that uh lights and sea says when you don't want or care to have something it finally comes to you it always happens like that right so bizarre this topic it hits hard ow <laughs> hey artist together bro i'm right there with you yeah i why i feel like artists we should be sticking together and lifting each other up i think too much and i was talking to if any of you know victor mori he works at riot games now so much of our college career we're like comparing to the point of like breaking other people down based on their faults or what are they doing wrong in their work they could have great color palettes but you'll be like yeah but their anatomy is awful like it's so garbage and you're, you're kind of cruel at least the people that i was around it wasn't meant to be super malicious but it was like the way that the competition would be had and we would compare ourselves to one another and the artists in the real world. But wow, am I at a way different perspective now where I try not to bad talk other artists. And it was, it was a hard lesson for me to learn that, yeah, if there's an artist that I feel have, has settled or is just going in for the money, that was their decision. And if they're happier doing that, I have zero right to talk smack about them. And the only, you know what I can do? I can focus on my work. I can, if I think someone has given up, well, I can push myself even harder than to be the opposite of that. You know, take everything as a learning experience for your own career, your own path, and do your best to encourage other artists and not tear them down. I don't care if they're doing <laughs> fan art, furry, whatever it might be that is oftentimes I feel put in a negative light, let those artists do those things. Let them draw those stuff because nothing is saying you have to, you know, and putting them down will not build you up. And I think that's something that we do when we're in art school or when we're younger as a way to kind of find where we stand or find how we compare with others. But I think doing it too much becomes unhealthy. So the earlier you just accept that other people are going to draw things that you might not like and just be okay with that, the better. 
Oof, I'm like, like running out of breath. I'm talking so much. Sorry. Okay, let's see here. Um, Fem says, I think Tigel meant fuel station from your metaphor. Gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> His highness means fuel station. <laughs> um, yes, that I, or I would hope that this would be a fuel station. I mean, some weeks are more playful and silly, but I feel like today has been oddly serious. <laughs> Maybe because I'm getting near the end of the year. Maybe it's because I'm just getting really old. I'm just so old. Uh, C. Molioned says, you're really good at renewing perspective, man. I hope so. Sometimes I like having that kick in my own butt of like refocusing, you know, recentering. Sammy says, oh, no, my dear, you're being ridiculous. Haha. <laughs> People get married so much later now and I find relationships all throughout their lives. But I think it's also sad that society sort of puts pressure on us, particularly women, to be in relationships in that we're spoiled goods by a certain age because our biological clocks are ticking. I've been reading a lot of articles about how it lately myself, who's currently single, but then again, I have been in so many relationships, so I know. I could not agree more. Uh, me and Kat talk about how most of our friends that we grew up with in grade school are married and have kids now, and that's just not in the cards for us mostly because we don't want them to be in the cards for us. I've always felt very counterculture and like obviously living with soon to be six people that are my friends. I, I never really liked the whole standard of you grow up, you go to school, you go to high school, you go to college, you find a relationship, you get married, you buy a house, you have kids, you have a dog. And then it like just continues from there until you die. And then you retire maybe at 65. I never liked this plan. I don't know who built this plan up, but guess what? It's not for me. I'm glad that it works for some people. It doesn't work for me. And being okay with that is cool. So for you, and I, I feel like now that I'm, I'm getting to know you better, Sammy, it's totally okay that you're not in a relationship and there's nothing that says you ever even have to be. It doesn't matter if your biological clock is ticking because then maybe kids weren't, you weren't meant to have kids. And if you really want kids, you can still adapt. You know, it's just one of those things where we, we put too much pressure on ourselves, but it feels like you're actually good about, you know, not putting that pressure on yourself. But I think it's good for other people to hear that, you know, it's okay with not following the standard that was built by society long ago. I mean, some of the things I do like, like roads, I like that that was built before I was born and I can use them, you know, throughout my life. So I'm also aware of the good things that society has built for us now that we're older. Um, Tigel says, yes, for my day job, I'm a, an assistant manager at one. That's why. Oh, yeah, he works at a gas station. Well, I thank you, audience member GQ for following, or QC for following. Um, yes, Tigel, you're getting fuel stationed every day. Or at the days that you work, at least. Um, ZA says, I answered it as when we die, we'll probably know the answers of the questions we come up with in this world because this world is kind of like a box and I imagine the world we go after death is outside the box. Yeah. Um, do you want me to just call you Boltrin? I'm going to say Boltrin. Well, you can help people to be better and help your friends as similar people. Nobody knows our struggles. Agreed. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I believe this is Ellen. Yep, Ellen says, you have a dog in the house? I do. It's not my dog. It's Tyler's dog, but uh, the dog's name is Luna. It's a little corgi. She is my arch nemesis. We do not get along. <laughs> and then we also have two cats in the house, Mushi and Astrid. And they're the reasons I am now a cat person, which I never thought I would ever say out loud, considering I grew up with a dog. I loved my dog. It was a three-legged Labrador. I loved Bo so much. But now I'm older, I definitely think I, I enjoy cats' company more <laughs> than I do with dogs. <laughs> Just because my time is so limited as is, and dogs require so much time and attention that I just cannot give for the career that I'm trying to build around myself. I cannot every like hour and a half let the dog out to go to the bathroom. Maybe if I had a doggy door, but I don't know. Cats kind of take care of themselves. I like that. Selfishly, I like that. Um, it's not a new cat. It's my boyfriend's cat. And when he moved in, the cat moved in too. 
Uh, ZA says, Keanu Reeves says he's single and that he doesn't feel alone. So yeah, it's totally all right. See? Keanu Reeves can do it. So can we. <laughs> all right, how much time do we got? Oh, we still got 25 minutes? Oh my God. You know what? Maybe I will start darkening parts of her then. Oh my gosh. I thought we were like almost out of time. Okay, so this would be my underdrawing. I'm going to go ahead and take a picture of red. And then I will go ahead and start adding some of my darker pencils. So for those of you who, who know my work, you know I love playing with contrast. So I'm going to do quite a bit of that today. So I'm going to be working with an HB, which you wouldn't think there is that much of a difference between H and HB, but I can definitely tell. All right. So I'm going to start adding it on. And usually I edge out areas first, so like areas that are prominent to me. So like for some reason this area stuck out, this part of the ear stuck out. And when I do the bridge of the nose, it's it's funny how I'm not really conscious of it anymore, but when I talk about it, I'm like, why did my hand and eye want to go there? And like, I'll push some dark areas here. Why, thank you, Fredona and Smolta, I think it said, for following. Sorry if I missed your username. That was really quick. Oh, Smolter. Smolter, I think it is. Um, do do do. Hey, Lane's here. Hi, Tim. Looks great so far. Thanks, Lane. Lane is one of our new friends that we met in this year, I believe. Or was it last year? Was it last winter? But she runs a local life drawing session, and that's how we first met her. And now she's become one of our good friends. And she helps out Key a lot, too. And actually, I'm going to, I believe it's this Saturday, I'm going to the life drawing session that she's hosting. So if any of you want to come meet us in person, we'll be in Waukesha <laughs> for a local life drawing session. It was March, okay. Well, oh, thank you, Smolter. Uh, Zongo says, I have I have Snake for the same reason. He just doesn't need anything from me, but when I come, he's kind of curious, playful with his little snoot. And I had a dog, and I felt like his he needs me all the time, and I just can't give it to him. Yeah, I mean, it's a little sad, because, I mean, I still I still like dogs, but usually it's like other people's dogs. I mean, if I did get a dog, it would either be a really big one, like a Great Dane. I just, I love big dogs. I think small dogs are okay. Actually, no, I don't even think they're okay. I just don't like small dogs. <laughs> and then, um, or a bulldog. I love bulldogs. Anything smaller than that, though, I'm like, ah, they just, they bark a lot. And like, right, did you, did you hear that? Literally, as I said, they bark a lot. Luna barked upstairs. They bark a lot. And they just, they nip at everything. They're always biting something. At least from my experiences, I maybe I've just been around a lot of bad small dogs. Um, Ellen says, do you find it hard switching between mediums? I've been away from digital for a while now, doing mostly watercolors, and now I tried coming back to digital, and it's rough, like really rough. Uh, digital is probably the one that is a little weirder to get back into because you're using a software. You're not like working with tangible form and medium. But I actually found no real difficulty switching between mediums. I think we it's been built for some reason in our brains that it's harder to switch between mediums, but it's not. It really is not. I don't care what other people say. It's all a mindset. For every day in October, I decided to challenge myself with a new medium every day, and it really wasn't that difficult. It like takes maybe an hour or two to kind of comprehend how the medium works and how to get like the similar shading style that you worked with before but once you kind of find that you're you're golden you're good just remember it's never the tool that makes the art it's the artist so red also has a lot of freckles so i want to make sure i'm including that how much did i include on our old ones oh yeah quite a bit
Um, let's see here. Want to borrow Elvis? Uh, no. <laughs> Elvis is her dog. No. I'm good. Thank you, though. Um, Godlike says, do you know anyone or any site or something like that can where I can pay someone to make a logo and stuff for me? Um, I used to be way more in tune with like freelance jobs and where to get them. I actually don't think I'm the best to recommend it anymore. Cause there used to be like these forums that people would go to, but I don't think they're as active anymore. So maybe someone in the chat will know. I feel like someone here will probably know a good place where to look for that. Um, for Lauren Meadow says, hi Tim, I've been a fan of your work for roughly about a year to going on two years. I first found you at the end of high school on Instagram and I've come to realize that the way you create your arc is within a similar vein to mine. Maybe that's why I love your work so much, LOL. Um, now I initially created my art profile on Instagram in 2016 when I was 18, but I was in a period of immense procrastination, getting out of high school, getting through college, and the following year, 2017, going through. Well, it's great. Wait, but where is where is your question? Or is this more just like your statement? I mean, if so, that's awesome. Glad you were able to find my work, but when you find that you're aware that you're procrastinating, you need to like be equally active to break that. Cause I think it's great that you're able to recognize that you, you tend to procrastinate, but unless you do something about it, that's where it's like, there's no one to blame but yourself then at that point. All right, let me shade this out here a bit more. So I'm definitely adopting more of the Eastern style of shading people more that that I get older. It's like their their skin tone and their um, the way that you shade it is very simple, almost blank. But then their clothing, the articles of weaponry or their hairstyles or fabrics are just super complicated and complex. And it's this contrast of simple and contrast where in the Western art world apparently it's almost the opposite where the the character themselves is very complicated like their skin tones the shading the values everything and then their wardrobe often tends to be more simple and i guess a good example are like the final fantasy games like look at lulu her if you see the original concept art by tetsuya nomura she is basically blank which is like a, a skin color filled in and then like a super ornate, complicated dress and detail. Doing this also reminds me of how much I love doing profiles. <laughs> I know that it's such a cliche for Tim, myself, to be doing this. And my friends, trust me, give me a, a lot of crap about drawing things in profile. Because I, I also give myself crap because I'm very aware that I do this a lot. Um, I like your drawing. Well, thank you, Godlike. Okay. Actually, yeah, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep focusing here. It's so weird. I'm actually moving faster than I normally work. And I feel like when I stream, I feel like I'm so slow. And maybe you guys are like, you've barely done anything. <laughs> but for me, this is actually uh, a bit of progress for... Because I feel like when I stream, I'm just so talkative. I'm just I'm way too talk heavy. And oftentimes I get distracted and I start noodling on my paper. I'm gonna give Red a little smile. She's so happy. So sometimes when I'm doing Red's hair, I'll draw like these little implication lines to like show that yeah it's a shaved 
head, but I'm not going to draw each individual hair. I'm just going to draw a few to imply that the whole head is covered. I feel like implications have become my new thing the past two years because I used to be so render heavy and I was like borderline hyper realism or like wanted to go down that route. But my contrast and my lighting never really fit it. It was always very unrealistic. So I think I've just been following that and I've been enjoying it way more than doing hyper realism. But I still like shading in a three dimensional form. It's just not realistic. I feel like that kind of has defined my style, honestly. To do, do. Um, Simolond, I can never say your name, says so totally random, but this is something I feel compelled to ask artists on, uh, I watch on streams. Do you whistle? I do. Lane says, do you have any tips on trying to get a likeness when doing portraits? Yes, actually. Um, back when I was, I think, 22, I was commissioned to draw my my friend's mom and her best friend. And I remember my first draft, it didn't look like them. And I realized it was because I was trying to make them look, quote unquote, pretty. And I didn't want what they might consider to be focusing on the flaws that they have to deter from the moment of like, I, it's you and your best friend. It's supposed to be a cute moment. So the second time I did it, I drew all their wrinkles, all their crow's feet, all the saggy bags, the heavy wrinkle underneath their eye. The, the things that, well, thank you, Jake Golden, for following. The things that I initially may have thought would offend them if I tried to capture. But then when I gave it to them, I realized they had so much joy because they could tell it was them. And because I focused on what would many consider, I guess, imperfections, it made them who they actually were. So I would say don't skimp on things that you might think will offend them, whether it's like really chubby cheeks or uh, smile lines or crow's feet or like broken blood vessels or a very porous and uh, nose, whatever it might be, include that because when you're capturing them, you're capturing them. You're not capturing a filtered version of them. So I hope that helps. Um, Brandon says, if anyone ever comes for Twitch banners or logos and stuff, send them my way. Brandon can definitely do some Twitch logos and Twitch banners. So if you need anything like that, contact that guy. Um, Gaddy C1 says, is fundamental something you still consider at your level, like to study and get better at? A hundred percent. Um, the way I've studied though has always been different from other people. You won't, will never see me drawing cubes or like spheres or things. Why thank you, Layla and Yikuga for following. Um, I like to implement my studies into my work. So like, for example, when I'm doing this, I'm going to be having them holding their weapons in front of them, like... In this pose, like standing, you know? So I'm going to be doing basically a study of those hands resting on an object, which I've never really drawn before. But I'm not going to like have a separate drawing and then do like studies of like breaking it down into blocks and feeling how a weight it will, it'll be. I've never been one of those artists. And I've always tried to make it a point that you don't have to do that. Um, I've never once filled like a sketchbook full of like cylinders with like wire wrapping. Uh, yeah, you might make mistakes along the way, but that's that's how you actually learn by doing. I feel like I'm not going to learn how to draw hands by drawing like pages and pages of cylinders of hands. You know, I'm really going to try to draw the hand itself and understand the nature of how to create those forms. And that I do think is important. And maybe one drawing I'll do of like cylinders or blocks, but that's it, you know. Take what you can learn from that one instance and then learn as much as you can from actually being on the job, as they would say. Um, to do. For Lone Meadow says, sorry for my first message was so long winded. I just want to say that you inspire me and the advice on procrastination was very much needed. Thank you. Well, I hope it helps and I hope that you can 
you know, push forward and push past that procrastination because that can be rough. Um, Jim says, I've been trying to become a consistently prolific artist for many, many years. I pop out a piece maybe every couple months or so, but to me, it never seems enough. Work makes me too tired at night. My therapist said she's been talking to me for six years now, and she said it's time to get shit or, or to get, oops, I'm not supposed to swear on here said it's time to blank or get off the bowl. My ideas are gone and now I've just given up waiting. Is my art dead? Um, no, your art can never actually be dead. The only time it can actually ever be dead is if you've fully given up on it. But if you're still creating, you're still an artist. Uh, the thing that I think a lot of people get confused with with art, and I don't necessarily know if this is for you either, but Making money doesn't determine if you're an artist or not. You can be an artist and be making zero money from your art, you know? Uh, I think in the society we live in, in the times that we live in, everything is very much calculated and judged by how much of an income, how much currency you make from whatever career path you've chosen. And it's just not true for an artist. And... <laughs> my high school teacher would always say all the time, um, if your art is liked by everyone or if you're a very uh, popular selling artist, most likely you're not very good because cheap items have many buyers. And that stuck with me. And, you know, I, I always wanted to prove her wrong. I wanted to be like, I wanted to be a popular artist and be um, considered a good artist. But now I, I kind of understand what she means. And it's the idea that your goal with art should not be to make money. If that is your goal, you're not making art. You're making products. You're making inventory. And never let anyone tell you that you're not an artist. And I think your therapist might be just trying to help you of like motivate you and be like, okay, let's... Well, I don't know if they're being like it's now or never because that's kind of how they worded it. But in my mind, it's like, it's never now or never. You, there's never a point where you're like, okay, this is it. If this next piece doesn't work, I guess I'll just never be an artist again. You can always be an artist. Why, thank you, Atomic Viper Snake, for following. But maybe put yourself more out there. Maybe try going to more conventions. Or if, if that's not the route, maybe try streaming more. If that's not the route, maybe create a Patreon. If not, that's not the route, maybe try doing more local shows. If that's not the route, maybe try doing more gallery stuff. If that's not the route, maybe try doing YouTube tutorials. Maybe try to educate people. And if that's not the route, maybe look for more freelance work. Look for commission stuff. Work first really cheap. You know, Try to just get your foot in the door and then move from there. I think there's so many opportunities nowadays for us as artists that there's never a point where you can just be like, it's, it's ending. This is done. Oof, okay. Sarah says, I always say to myself, I'll say to myself, I'll draw while watching these streams, but I'm just having tea and watching how you draw. Oh, that's nice too. And I would be drinking more of my my vegan chocolate milk, but it's making me breathless. It's like whew, I just gotta get all my words out. Um C Moleond says, Haha, you whistle good. Thanks for that. You bet. Adrian says, isn't Peter Moore more business oriented, but still considered a good artist though? I consider him a great artist, but he's also very smart about his money. And I think that's kind of the type of artist I want to be. But I also feel when I talk to Pete, he definitely has this plan for like years to come and he's going to just build on this angelarium theme, which has worked very well for him. But I, I am definitely one of those people that I jump a lot from like different ideas and that's why it's hard for me to even stick to sword play a lot of the time is because I'll have a, a new idea. It's like I want to do a drawing f entirely made of arms and hands and that's why I'm working on that now. But that's a huge distraction. Or I think for Pete, he would be like, well, it doesn't fall in line with my brand or it doesn't fall in line with what I do for Angelarium, so I'm not going to do it. But he's he's very good about that. Where I it would physically I think bother me not to do it. So yes, and I want to be considered something along the same lines as Pete, 
but I don't want money to be something I'm known for, I guess. Maybe like good with numbers or willing to fail. I guess that I'd be okay with being known for, but I don't really care if I make much more money than I am now. I mean, even this year, I felt like I, I made a good enough revenue to, I mean, if I made this the rest of my life, I'd be totally content, you know? Um, okay, we only got a few more minutes here, so I'm gonna look at the last minute questions here and then we will end the stream. Um, Zongo says, I really appreciate that you have this approach to learning. Sometimes I focus on this thinking about, am I learning right? And this is when you step in and you say, you can have different approaches and that's okay. And this helps me a lot. Absolutely. I have done things so wrong. Even like this drawing, think about it. I didn't really put fundamental lines of like where the eyes and go and where, you know. And yeah, maybe it'll look a little wonky in the end, but that contributes to my style a bit where I'm not looking for hyper-realism. If I shade the nose a little darker than the rest of the skin, it's not because it's realistic. It's because that's the way I want to do it. Um, ZA says, what if you're not doing art for the money or just because of the passion? What if you're doing both? Um, ooh, that's a good question. I would like to argue that I'm doing it for both, but I think deep down in my gut, the truth is I need to make money to continue what I'm doing, but I just, I genuinely love drawing. So like, it doesn't matter to me if I make a butt ton of money. And like, to be honest, this year, I've never made as much, I've never really made six figures before. And this year was just, it completely like flipped the script on me. And I, I did pretty well this year. But looking back, it wasn't my goal to be the super rich person. It was just to be financially stable. And I think that's a good enough goal to have if you're able to also pursue your passion in life. And for me, I'm able to draw every day if I want. And that to me is success. So financial success means a lot more little to me than it used to. Um, Jay says, have you ever heard of Alec Benjamin? I feel like you might really like his music. I have not. I could check it out though. Common Boy says, do you think you should attempt a good drawing after consistently making bad ones or just let it happen naturally? Always naturally. I feel like the best drawings happen organically. Um, Jim says, I do think it's a matter of trying more different things. I went to LuxCon this year, fell in love, of course, but now I definitely look at Imagine FX in a different light. Digital art doesn't do it for me as it used to. Perhaps I'm changing, evolving. Yeah, I think even when I went to the workshop, I noticed there was a really big like anti-digital movement going on. And I, I, it's weird because I do traditional, but I'm one of the first to defend digital because I was a teacher of it for so long that yeah, it has its own heartaches and learning curves to it as well. Is it easier to modify and edit things? A hundred percent. Absolutely. But I don't think we should just instantly write it off. Like I think a lot of ours now are, and a lot of the public is too. One of my good friends, Pui, all of his stuff is digital. And he always has to explain to people that it's digital but done in a traditional style and they'll talk about how his background was in painting and blah 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 because i think a lot of people just disconnect with digital which i guess in a way i have in some regard too but yeah that'll happen you're changing your taste is changing and people would say that the higher ups especially like the ones you meet at aluxcon they definitely look down at digital art and they believe that traditional is the best way and there's arguments both way, but I mean, it's a matter of opinion. So take whichever stance you want and then run with it. Hey, Sean says, if you, in your opinion, and make it real quick, if you just can, because I just realized it's almost, but do you feel the terms, <laughs> man, you must have typed this quick, Sean. Staving artist is irrelevant today with so many avenues of getting your work out there. Um, yeah, I mean, we've talked, I think, Specifically, Sean and I have talked about this before too, where there's so many different routes you can make money nowadays as a modern artist. And like 30 years ago, completely different landscape. Nowadays with the internet and the ease of access to making money worldwide, not just like locally, 
there's like no excuse to try your best to make it as an artist and be financially stable. And just from the avenues that I have, it's like conventions, Patreon, Etsy, Twitch and YouTube. And then I used to do freelance. Now I don't at all. And those are like my five avenues of money. And I think too many artists think that they have to have like one, but try to have a lot and have one be like your main one. This is what I was taught from an Uber driver actually is to have one be your main income driver. And for me, that's conventions. But I want that to eventually be Patreon, so I'm trying to do more of a shift next year. But Sean's totally right. I don't think starving artist is relevant today. Oh, yeah. I think we're going to cut this one off because um, I'm already past my time, and I need to go to Subway. I need to eat. I think I might keep the Santa hat on, though. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. I'm going to... Uh, I don't know what I'll be working on next week, but I will definitely be doing a stream next week. And I want to thank you guys so much for coming to this live stream. Like I said, I do these every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central Time. And if you would like to continue discussing or want to join our community, there's a Discord link below. I am far more active on it than I've ever been. And I'm going to continue doing that in the next year. I want to start hosting some contests, some challenges, share critiques, like do more things that would build an art community in the way that is helpful, is motivating, and hopefully inspiring. So if you want to join it, you can link it to below. It's free. There's no joining cost or anything. We're not a cult yet. So <laughs> you don't have to worry about any of that. All right, but I'm going to go to Subway. So I want to thank you guys again so much for coming, and we'll talk to you next week. All right. Bye, 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 bye.